Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here. Bright, shining faces. <laughs> all right. Uh, I was wondering if we were going to have enough rain to make the road to Massey, but not yet. We can always keep praying for that. Well, I want to, uh, again, welcome you here and just uh, do a couple of things by way of announcements. Um, last Sunday, uh, for those of you who weren't able to be here, we had um, a little ceremony to welcome Bill and Jim Pastel as members of Antrim Church. And uh, it's a joy to have you here as members, and um, if you haven't yet, welcome them officially uh, after the service today. And then, uh, are under our community concerns in the, in the bulletin, um, we got word this morning that Yogi Bear passed away. This morning, and uh, so if you know of Yogi, uh, I don't I haven't heard anything about the services yet. Uh, do we know who is he affiliated with any church or? He's Catholic. He's Catholic. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So we need to keep him family in prayer. All right. Uh, any other concerns this morning? Joys. We can do those later. I'm just thankful that uh, my grandson found a place to live in Seattle, Washington. Good. And we got home. And that was your grandson. I think I made a mistake last week. I said, shut your son. But, okay, good. Wonderful. Hi, Joy. Uh, we did finally get that little window of opportunity to go to Colorado and pull off. And we went to church last Sunday at Pitkin, Colorado, which is a little tiny community church. Coincidentally, um, the pastor who was preaching, he was a United Methodist pastor, he was at Kingman for four years, he ran the urban ministries in Wichita for 11 years, and he was best friends with Gary Appleton. Grew up with Gary Appleton, who married us, and baptized Chelsea, and I mean, those connections are just very interesting when they happen. And we got a call from Dorothy and Irving while we were in Colorado, and they're doing well, getting settled, and Irving said he gave himself a month of doing house stuff before he looks for a job, but they're doing well. So that was interesting. And all of the plants that we gave them survived the trip and are living. <laughs> well, I have a joy. These are from my husband. For our 59th anniversary. Now, I'm going to take a few of them out because they weren't smiling anymore. But uh, I thought we all knew to enjoy these. Come from a husband after 59 years with a pump from a daughter and a son. <laughs> and give thanks to God's holy name. We exalt you, God, and you have restored us to life. We may cry through the night, but your joy comes in the morning. You hear us, O God, and you are gracious in our distress. You turn our mourning into dancing. Our souls cannot be silent. O God, our Savior, we give thanks. And please turn in your hymnal to 
number 61. And please stand with me as we sing. around them and, and uh, may they know your 
loving care for them at this time. And to Father, um, I just desire to, to say thank you for the opportunities where we can get away and uh, experience relaxation and rest. Um, you modeled that for us, Lord Jesus, and we know how important that is to rejuvenate our bodies and our minds. And so, Lord, as we uh, as we gear up for uh, for school and uh, and so forth, we ask, Lord, that you would um, that you would watch over our our classrooms, those who are there studying in our classrooms and our schools. Pray, Lord, for our, our teachers who are taking that uh, burden of care uh, on their shoulders to, to uh, teach and train our children uh, in the ways of, uh, of uh, our world. And Lord, I ask that, uh, that you would bless them and, and keep them. Father, too, uh, as we anticipate uh, the, the going away of, of college students. Um, we ask that you would protect them, lead them into fellowship with other Christian believers um, who, who love you and um, that they would be lights in a dark place. In many of our college campuses, Lord, are dark places and, and there are many lost people and, and so we just ask that you would help our young people witnesses uh, of your love and grace. And now, Father, we, um, we just uh, come together uh, in one voice, uh, praying as we were instructed. Our Father, who comes in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now turn in your hymnals to number 700.
morning from the Old Testament. We've already had our psalm scripture reading, but from the Old Testament we hear from 2 Samuel um, in chapter 18. And I'm reading this morning in the New Living Translation. And the king gave this command to Joab, Abishai, and Ittai. For my sake, deal gently with young Absalom. And all the troops heard the king give this order to his commanders. So the battle began in the forest of Ephraim. And the Israelite troops were beaten back by David's men. There was a great slaughter, and 20,000 men laid down their lives that day. The battle raged all across the countryside, and more men died because of the forest that were killed by the sword. During the battle, Absalom came unexpectedly upon some of David's men. He tried to escape on his mule, but as he rode beneath the thick branches of a, of a great oak, his head got caught. His mule kept on going and left him dangling in the air. And then verse 15 Ten of Joab's young armor bearers then surrounded Absalom and killed him. And then verse 31 to 33. Then the man came from Cush, arrived and said, I have good news for my lord the king today. The lord has rescued you from all those who rebelled against you. What about young Absalom, the king demanded? Is he all right? And the Cushite replied, May all of your enemies, both now and in the future, be as that young man is. The king was overcome with emotion. He went up to his room over the gateway and burst into tears. And as he went, he cried, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I could have died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son my son. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. This has been a fascinating story to bone up on. It's one that I haven't read in, in a number of years and so it's been an opportunity to um, go back and read the entire story of Absalom and how he fits in David's family and so forth. But picture, and we'll do some background to kind of help with that here. But picture David, the king, who is supposed to be, they go to great lengths to help a king remain happy and joyful. You know, they have the jesters and the, and the entertainers and all of, of this going on. But here we see the king trembling, wailing, wailing the horrifying cry of a father whose son has been killed, the news of which has just reached his ears. The one thing he prayed would never happen. The one thing that he instructed his commanders to not let happen. There, let there be no doubt that David loved his son Absalom. But the story begins long before 2 Samuel chapter 18. Um, Absalom is one of many sons of David. He's a popular prince among the people and, and a favorite of his father as well. Absalom's attractiveness goes beyond his handsome appearance. When he is in public, his regal uh, presentation of himself uh, captivate, captivates the hearts of the people and he drives this, uh, this beautiful ornate chariot with 50 men running ahead of him uh, whenever he goes through the streets. Such grandeur has its desire effect on, on numbers of young nobles throughout Jerusalem. Um, they they, they have grown loyal to him because of this reality that he emits as he walks down or rides down the street. Now much of the trouble begins in the family when Amnon, David's oldest son, and Absalom, uh, uh, 
Absalom's half-brother, half uh, ravishes Absalom's sister Tamar. This is not a good event in a family, as you can imagine. Um, inexplicably, though, their father, King David, ignores this thing that happened. And, um, and because of that, he, he doesn't take any action uh, against Amnon to bring justice to the situation. And there's no explanation given for that in Scripture. Um, but failing, you know, he, t he doesn't take any action. Um, who knows why? But Amnon's assault on, on Tamar and, and David's inaction enrages Absalom. And as we can all imagine. But Absalom doesn't react right away. He bides his time. Now two years, it, the story jumps two years down the road. And he carries out this premeditated plan to have Amnon killed. And in the process, it becomes very evident that he was responsible for having, it, having, having that happen. So Amnon is now dead. Again, the oldest, he's the oldest of David's son, which normally speaking, you would think that is the person that, who is in line for the throne. Well, having killed Amnon, he escapes into exile for fear that his warrior father, King David, will come after him. But after three years, David relents and allows Absalom back into Jerusalem, but not into the palace. David will not see his son. Meanwhile, Absalom makes use of his popularity among the people and his newfound freedom in rebellion against his father, the king. He enlists loyalists from throughout Israel to prepare for war with David's faithful army. And Absalom has the numbers, but David has the experience. Well, we've read how the war turns out. Absalom's army is routed by David's veteran forces. So, in, in, so inexperienced are Absalom's men that the forest of Ephraim claims more lives than David's army that day. Now Joab, one of David's commanders, who was instructed not to allow anything to happen to Absalom, conspired uh, earlier had conspired to influence the king to allow Absalom back into Jerusalem. But perhaps feeling responsible for Absalom's insurgence as a and rebelliousness, Joab vows to uh, defend Jerusalem against Absalom. Then during the battle, Absalom's long hair becomes ensnared in the branches. Uh, it's said that Absalom had like five pounds of hair. Okay, he had a lot of hair. Um, who's that guy from the, uh, Troy Palomalu? <laughs> Maybe he was a, that kind of hair. <laughs> I don't know. But he had a lot of hair, and he gets caught in the tree and is dangling there, and Joab discovers him there, and he actually is the first to stab Absalom three times with, with three different spears in the heart, and then he uh, sends his servants to finish the job. When word reaches David, he mourns. And how absolutely heart-wrenching is the cry of David how deep is the grief that he suffers here? Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son. How deep is the grief of a father at the loss of a son? Whatever conditions may surround it, whatever tensions there may be on a relationship, every parent can identify with the pain and, or even the possibility of having one, one's own child die first. Every parent has awakened in the night in the horror of a nightmare where their child has been killed or dies unexpectedly. David moves us, proclaiming that he would rather put down his own life in the place of Absalom. What parent would also do this to preserve the life of their own child? 
Then how many of us know something of Absalom's rebellion? How relevant it is to parents whose children take self-destructive paths. Sadly, no matter how deeply a parent loves a child, or how willing to sacrifice one's own life, neither of these things can save Absalom. Now while David mourns Absalom's death, let us also explore the possibility that David's grief transcends just losing his son. We cannot read this story without also concluding that David's suffering and loss are not above suspicion. It is a consequence of David's own sin that this trouble is being visited upon his, fam his own family. We already know that if, if we know the story of Bathsheba and the, the sin that took place there, we know that the child that was conceived with Bathsheba, the first child, was stillborn, was dead. And so the Lord took that child. So um, we know that God um, had visited judgment upon David, and he thought this is possibly playing out again or still as the curse on my family. But David blew it in many ways, some of which we may never know. Raising children isn't easy. The hardest part of raising children is when we as parents make grave errors in parenting, the kind of thing you can't undo, spoken words that cut to the bone, a major life event that's missed because uh, some last-minute task took too long, uh, uh, unmet expectations, broken promises, teasing taken too far uh, to, to the point that it creates scars, failing to perform parental stand, to, up to parental standards or, or values, uh, discipline that's not applied, discipline that's applied beyond uh, reason or without compassion, and so on. All of these things can, can uh, cause damage. We don't know all the things that David did. But this saga of sin and judgment being handed down from fathers to sons, parent to child, is a topic that's not antiquated. It's not, it's not just limited to the ancient stories in our world. This story of David and Absalom illustrates a tragic and sobering end to the eternal battle between self-centered, free will, um, rebellious, youngsters and, and uh, parents that struggle with that and, and also God's judgment. David's mourning expresses how the depth of his loss, acknowledgement of his own sins, and God's justice all came together to make this tragic thing come to pass. Now we notice in David's suffering how our own grief over many losses we have experienced, not simply as victims, but also as culprits. How much more painful is the suffering when we know that if we had done something different back when, the outcome now would be a much different thing. How much more painful is the suffering when we know that we had a hand in creating that suffering? It is the mis misery of our soul coupled with the pain of our heart. How many parents and children torn apart because of the family business uh, becomes more important than the relationships. Like David, we often learn to love when it's too late. You know, David, his family business was to run a country. You know, and then, and then uh, you get tied up between, okay, am I, am I supposed to play the kingly role now, or am I supposed to play the parental role now? And sometimes that gets jumbled up. And we can imagine the same thing. But like David, we often learn to love when it's too late. When David's love would have made a difference, the king would not be humbled. He invited Ab Absalom back into Jerusalem, but he did not also provide access to the father's love. Think of it. How many things have been different, would have been different, if David would have taken the role of the prodigal, uh, the prodigal's father in Jesus' parable, uh, you know the parable of the prodigal son? 
the lost son in Luke chapter 15. I imagine that David might have waited for his son's return by the city gate. Can you see Absalom coming up the road to Jerusalem with his entourage? And can you see David as he bolts out on a dead run toward Absalom, enveloping him in a full frontal embrace? David confesses his wrongs to his son, apologizes for his behavior, asks forgiveness of Absalom, offers forgiveness to Absalom, and welcomes back the son into the palace, returning him from exiled enemy of the state to full status as a son. What a picture of love, forgiveness, and grace that would be. But sadly, David doesn't do this. Perhaps neither do we. It may be possible that some of us here today could not play the part of the parent in the story of the prodigal because we are still playing the role of the lost son. We've walked away from everything good so we can pursue happiness, but we're more miserable than the day that we left. We don't know how to forgive because we've never found forgiveness. Perhaps you can't find it in your heart to forgive. Our Heavenly Father did. He ran to us on the road, and He did offer us forgiveness. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were Absalom, while we were still enemies of the state in exile, Jesus came to us in death in order to restore us to the Father. Jesus paid a steep price. His body was broken. His blood was poured out. It cost Him everything. Through him, Absalom can be saved. And if you identify with Absalom today, you need to know this, if nothing more, that there is no scenario on earth where your sin is so great that God cannot forgive it, because he already has. And so I encourage you to see, receive his forgiveness today. And if you have an Absalom in your family, if you have been separated for years, perhaps even decades, the power to restore your relationship with that lost child is in the forgiveness of Christ. Because he forgave you, you can forgive and ask forgiveness of your Absalom. You can take the risk of the first step because Christ has shown you rich mercy. Now maybe you have already done all that you can to reconcile with your lost child if you're in that situation. You've been shut out by that child. Then my encouragement to you is to pray. Pray and keep praying. That's where the victory is won. Whatever the case, my prayer is that we're that everyone here walks out of here today confident of one thing, that saving Absalom is possible through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let there be no doubt. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word and um, Lord, I just am reminded how important my words are, how, how important my actions are with, with regard to my children and my raising of my children. And I ask, Father, that you would give me strength and wisdom uh, to be a good father. And my prayer is also for each one here and the rest of our family who are not here that you would guide them into um, right relationships with one another and with you. And now as we prepare for our offering, Holy God, we thank you for making us, each of us, a, a beloved child in your great family. You guide us by your spirit to the way of life. Through your grace, we have enough to share with our neighbors who are in need. 
May these offerings bring your kindness to strangers. We pray through Christ who loved us and gave himself as a fragrant offering and sacrifice while we were yet strangers.
Spirit be with you all. Amen.